2 Peter chapter 1, and we will be looking at verses 5 through 11 this morning. So 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 5, it says, But also for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now again, as we kind of continue in, you know, what Peter has been talking about in this, in this book, the second letter that he wrote, we started talking about his introduction of being a bond servant. Last week, I think we saw this really valuable perspective where Peter was talking about the multiplication of grace and peace into our lives. And sometimes we get to the point like, well, why don't I have grace and peace in my life? Well, Peter's like, get to know your God more. It's like, stop going to all these other places. Peter says, if you want grace and peace multiplied in your life, grow in the knowledge of God and your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Learn how much power he has. Learn what he's done for you. Learn what he still promises you. He said last week that he has exceedingly great and precious promises that he has promised us. But sometimes we go elsewhere. Sometimes we do it on our own. Sometimes we don't start with him. And he literally says, I will multiply grace and peace in your life. And we want that. And yet we still don't sometimes go to the source of it. Last week in the talking of that, in the talking about growing in the knowledge of our God, he said that God has given us by his power. It says by his divine power, he has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. He's not talking about wants. He's not necessarily talking about physical things. I mean, Bible also talks about physical things to a point, but he says, I've given you everything that you need to pursue what I'm talking about. I've given you every last thing by my power that you need to live the godly life that I have called you to. He says, I've given you all of that by my power. But, and this is where it connects to this week, just because he has given us all of the resources that we need to do this well, that's what we talked about last week, he's given us all the resources, but just because he has given us all the resources that we need, that doesn't mean that we don't have to work on things. Just because he's given us the resources doesn't mean that we don't have to put the work in too. In this passage this morning, this is a continuation of where he was coming from. He talked about last week escaping all of the draw of the world and coming into this life that God has for us. You've escaped that. And he says, now that that's happened, now that you've escaped that, now that you've come to the, the, really the presence and the salvation of God, now in this place, he's given you everything you need, but now there's work to do in light of these things. In this passage this morning, Peter is encouraging growth in our faith, growth in our walk with the Lord, growth in the action of what that means and looks like. And we talk about this, and we look at this, like we talk about this in church, we talk about growing and, and growing, growing. Like, why is that important? Like, why, and this is in this context, spiritual growth. Why is spiritual growth so important? I mean, you just take that to the base level of things when, even in just living, you know, you think of the old movie quotes, like, get busy living or get busy dying. <laughs> it's just like, you know, you think of those things, it's like you're going one way or the other. You're either... Like you're either proactively living forward 
or you're stagnating and slowly dying. <laughs> That's what your spiritual walk is too. Your spiritual walk is I, either I'm actively moving towards him or I'm staying still or moving backwards. And when we stay still and we're just sitting there and we're not doing anything, the sitting still usually ends up with us falling backwards. If we're not proactively moving forward, we're not growing. But why is that growth in this context so important? One, it deepens. Like as we grow spiritually, as we know more of him, as we get active in the things that he has called us to do, as we, our life begins to transform into his ways, it deepens our relationship with him. And this is like cyclical. You know, you have the relationship with him, you begin growing, your relationship deepens with him. As your relationship deepens with him, you become more proactive in doing the things that he has called you to do because you know him better. And the cycle of that continues and you grow. And as we do this, it, it matures us in our faith. You know, when you are saved, the moment of salvation, you're not made perfect. You're not made to know everything at that moment. You're not perfected. I'm not a perfect person. There's no perfect person in this room, but we're supposed to be growing. Like our life with the Lord shouldn't look like, you know, like crazy ups and downs and all the place. Our life with the Lord should be, you know, it doesn't mean that there's not difficulties along the way, but it should be a trajectory upwards. It should be growth. It should be not pride driven growth. It should be glory driven growth. It's like, I know who he is. I know how good he is. I know what he's done in my life. I've seen that it's true. I've seen what he's done for others. I see what he's promised us. I've seen what he, he calls me to. And so every day, every month, every year, my goal is to grow upwards and onwards towards his glory and what he has called for me in my life. It matures us. It helps us to distinguish between good and evil. It helps us to make wise decisions. It helps us to make the decisions that he's called us to make. It helps us show and tell other people about him. When we're not growing, if we're stagnating, if we're moving into problem areas, if we're doing things that we're not supposed to do, we're in no way, shape or form reflecting him properly. If he is our God and if he has saved us and if we are his people, if we are just stagnating, moving backwards, going in a different direction, then we are not reflecting him properly in this world. And if we really know him and if our relationship was deepening with him, then we know that one of the most important things that we have is our testimony and that reflection that a great God pulled me out of darkness into light. And I want the world around me to see that. Growth causes that to happen more effectively. Growth strengthens us against temptation. As I grow, Maybe I've dealt with things. Maybe I've helped other people deal with things. Maybe we're still dealing with things, but I'm still growing. But as we grow, we become more able. We, we know more of the word. We know what God tells us in this situation. We've, we've experienced this. We've seen his wisdom. We've, we've walked the walk. We've seen others walk the walk. And it strengthens us in dealing with the problems that we face all of the time because all of us face temptation. It comes from different places, but as we grow, we become better <coughs> equipped to deal with these things. And spiritual growth equips us to serve. The goal of this, the goal of all of this, like you have to know, like our heart even, and still in the church, our heart is not people sitting in seats. <laughs> That's not our heart. Our heart is your life transformed so that when you walk out of here, or even as you engage with each other here, that your heart is, I want to love and serve my brothers and sisters, and I want to love and serve my God. That's the goal. And if in that goal, God ever takes you elsewhere to do that, then that's his prerogative. But while you're here, our goal isn't just the main maintenance of you sitting in a seat once a week. Our goal is for you as an individual and myself still as an individual to grow and to grow and to grow so that the people around you benefit from that spiritual growth and so that your God gets more glory from your spiritual growth. Not the name of this church, not the head count, not any of that. It's for the loving of your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving of your neighbor too. Like that's the goal. It's growing in those things. Because you see this again, like I said, he said last week, I have given you everything that you need to do this well. He says, I've given you everything that you need. 
for life and for godliness. But then when you come into the first verse of this week, it says in verse 5, but for this very reason, he says, giving all diligence. Diligence is a work word. <laughs> it is. When we talk about diligence, and you know, I've conveyed, I don't know if I've ever used the word, but I try to convey this concept to my children. <laughs> and, but it's just like diligence. It is, you know, putting in the work necessary to see something done. You know, if you don't work at the thing that needs to be done, don't expect it to happen. <laughs> it's like you put in the work, you put in the effort, you, you, you learn and you prepare. You know, even like, like scripture calls me to, it says, you know, when you're getting ready to teach, it says to diligently prepare so that you can divide the, the word properly and teach it. It's like, I have to have diligence. And it's like, there's an accountability aspect for me to prepare, to be able to talk about God's word. But we do that in all parts of our life. I'm, I seek to be diligent in my job. I seek to be diligent in the parenting of my, my kids towards my wife, towards, you know, the people that we love and the, the church. And we seek to be diligent in those things, regular, consistent. We work at it. It doesn't just happen. <laughs> you know, it's not just, oh, we fell into it. It's all perfect. You work at it. He says here, give all diligence. It's conveying like earnestness and zeal and really careful effort in accomplishing the tasks. It talks about being committed and passionate in the pursuit of these things. And when we talk about being passionate in the pursuit of these things, when we talk about spiritual growth, well, Peter starts giving us some kind of characteristic words of like what that should begin to, to look like in our life. So what can we be pursuing in our spiritual growth process? When we were like, I want to grow. What do I grow in? When Peter gives us kind of a play-by-play, -play, like a step-to-step -step process here. You know, again, last week we talked about growing in the knowledge of our God and how that brings grace and peace into our lives. And Peter brings a lot of practical direction to build on top of that with all of the diligence that we are supposed to have, with all of the, the work that we're supposed to be willing to put into this, the first thing that Peter says, he says, add to your faith virtue. Now, these are like building blocks. He's like, hopefully as we sit here today, we have that core element of real faith. I mean, there's really no, re there's no possibility of spiritual growth. I mean, we can grow, you know, morally and in some, you know, relatively good things and such, but we can't grow spiritually rooted in the Lord and in, in a life purpose necessarily for Him if there is not a foundation of faith to build on. So he says, with that foundation of faith, add virtue. Virtue can be defined as goodness or, you know, moral excellence, like I'm seeking to, you know, pursue morality and do the right things. Virtue has characteristics like integrity and goodness and righteousness in the everyday actions and decisions we make. It's like, I'm, I'm seeking to do the right things in these situations. Like God has said, do things this way. When I have this foundation of faith, then on top of that, I'm going to begin to build virtue. Like I want to know the, I want to, I want to do the right things. I want to I have a strong desire. I will work at it. I want to do the right things morally, things that are good in my everyday actions and decisions. It's seeking to make my actions in my life more like Jesus. Virtue builds on that faith because it's faith becoming action. But Peter keeps going. He says, on top of that foundation of faith, we add virtue, like I want to do the right things. And on top of virtue, he says, knowledge to virtue, knowledge, still there in verse five. Again, foundation of faith. I want to do the right things on top of that. Then you add knowledge to that because you're not going to do the right things if you don't know what the right things are. <laughs> you have to have the building blocks that are starting to come into place. Again, you know, I see people come to know the Lord and I see them fired up. Like, I want to do these things. I want to do these right things. But you need to add knowledge to that. Like, you know, not just the, just the intellectuality of it, but you need to add understanding to that because you take that fire and you need to apply it to the right things. 
So with that desire for goodness, you add the understanding of what that needs to be directed to. It's, it's insight, it's discernment, it's, it's understanding, it, it's knowing the things of the word and not knowing every single word of it. You, you gain that throughout a lifetime of studying it, but it's generally knowing things like God would have me do this in this situation. God would have me make this decision in this situation. God would have me treat this person this way. God would have me interact with the church this way. God would have me honor and worship him this way. It's, it's knowing those things. It's, it's you getting that framework of knowledge that adds to your desire to do good that's built on your foundation of faith. And it's just the building as it happens. When you back action with knowledge, it's not just blindly trying to be a good person. It's understanding why God has called us to these things and how he wants us to do it. And again, he keeps building. It was faith, virtue, knowledge. And he says to knowledge add self-control. Self-control. This is, I think this is a tough one in this day and age. I think people think like, ah, you know, self-control. But self-control means, you know, a mastery over your desires and your impulses. It's the discipline to act according to what's right, not necessarily to what you want. <laughs> There's a reason why you have to have self-control because sometimes your self isn't in control and wants to do other things. We've looked at this in scripture. It says literally your own flesh and body is at war against the good that your soul is supposed to be about. It says there is a war going on. One of the steps in this growth process is the control of self. And that's not really, I think, just accomplished by like, I've got it. I've gotten strong. I can, you know, Paul even said, like, I will beat my own body into submission. He's like, my body wants to do this. I'm going to beat my own body into submission. So I'm not doing these things. He's like, my own body, my own, my own mind wants to do the things that I'm not supposed to do. And I know that it's wrong. And so he says, I beat myself into submission. So I don't do these dumb things. You know, that's not necessary. Like, that's maybe part of the process. But then we also see that self-control is one of the characteristics of walking with the Spirit of God. Again, as we talked about, you know, why growth is important as we grow, as we grow in relationship with Him, as we grow closer to Him, as we understand that the Spirit of God resides inside of us, as we are willing to, to lean on Him and to embrace His power and to pursue His ways, Scripture says, walk with His Spirit. Listen to what He has to say. And I think that's so foreign to some of us, but as you, you grow in Him and as you, you learn the wisdom of Scripture and you hear, as you walk and as you do things, as you confront things, you feel that, that you know, the understanding of the Spirit of God inside of you saying, don't go that way. And sometimes you're like, eh, I'm just going to go that way anyways. Bad decision. But the whole concept of walking with the Spirit is that God's power is inside of you. His, and we're filling with the understanding of what he wants. And in every one of my days, as the Spirit of God would say, walk that way, I take that step. As he takes that step, I take that step. And I just go, and I go, and I'm going to go his way, where he's going. I follow him day after day. He says, I've given you all of the power to walk my way. Now walk my way. But sometimes myself, as God says, go that way, myself wants to go that way. And that's the decision, and that's the place where, you know, with the power of the Spirit of God, I say, I know myself in my own power, in my own will, in my own decision, my own wants, would want that. But I know that that's not what God has for me. So in this moment, due to my relationship with him, due to the growth that I have, due to the power that he has enabled me with, due to the, the, the spirit of God that is guiding me, even though I want to go that way, I will walk that way because it's what God has for me. We saw when we went through James, James said, your own self it says, within your own self, you build up your own desires and your own desires lead to sin and your sin leads to death. Like that's the, that is the, I don't know, the, the way of doing things for our flesh. But God says, walk my way. He's like, we got to keep ourselves in check. The exercise of self-control ensures that the knowledge that we have been gaining in the last step doesn't remain just theoretical. <laughs> but it's practically applied and it leads to actual change and growth. When we can control ourselves, when we can 
see past our desires and impulses, when we can actually walk God's way, then this becomes no longer just theoretical and it becomes practical and actual in our lives. But Peter continues, he says, to self-control, add perseverance. Perseverance. I think that's a tough one for us too. Perseverance is that I can still stand here, I can still do this, I can still endure, even when it gets hard to do so. Especially when it gets hard to do so. It's the ability to remain faithful and committed despite difficulty. But again, this is one that is not just rooted in our personal strength. It's one that we can grow and we can understand and we can be resolved in. But we should know as an individual sitting here that in that moment of difficulty, the strength to stand is there. It may not be in your own legs. It may not be in your own mind. But it is in his power and his presence in which you can still stand despite the difficulties. Again, Matthew 7, we've been through many, many times. He's like, if you obey me, he said, like, obeying me, Jesus is talking. And Matt said, he said, obeying me is like building on a rock. He's like, not just liking me, not just knowing me. He says, obeying me day in and day out. The words that I have shared with you is like building your house on a rock. And eventually that terrible storm is going to come. But if you build here and not somewhere else, he says, you will still stand at the end of that day. Your house will still be standing and you will still be standing. But notice in that situation, that it's not because, you know, I got strong and, you know, the strength of my arms and legs, I wrapped around something and held on for dear life. No, it's just Jesus says, because you build here, you will still stand. You know, it's Romans 5 where it talks about like just like glorying in tribulations. He says, you can glory in tribulations, but there's this interesting statement that's there. It's not that you can glory and you can be great in the midst of difficulty because you're so strong. The idea of that passage when Paul was writing says you can glory in tribulation because God holds you. The, the Greek word there is literally like God holds your head up <laughs> in the midst of that situation. So not that you're so strong to do it, but that he is able to still hold you up and keep you through that situation. When we have this control, like as the growth of these things are happening, and we add perseverance to it, it's staying the course. It's not letting the things of life derail us. It's being it's a consistent that even though the storm is raging, I still see what's going on here. I still know that he's got me. I still know that I need to stay the course, even though it's hard right now. Perseverance is that element of endurance. It's the maintenance of self-control over the long haul and not just for temporary times. So again, Peter keeps building and building and I want to, you know, cover these without taking too long, but we've got to see all of them because they're so good. To perseverance, to that endurance, to that steadfastness, Peter says, add godliness. Godliness. Godliness here refers to kind of the devotion of one's life towards the honoring, reverence, and praise of God. It's a God-centric mindset in every element of our life. Godliness emerges as perseverance shapes us and matures us in our spiritual life. It's, a, it's a, an increasingly deep commitment in living the way that pleases God. As a believer, as we persevere, as we, as we make it through the things, we make it through this thing, we make it through that thing, we grow in this thing, we see God's goodness, we see the life that he has for us. Hopefully those lead us to an, an increasingly deeper commitment. Hopefully the focus begins to shift, not just to dealing with life and making it through, 
but to be founded upon maintaining that daily walk with the Lord and seeking His strength, His perseverance, His guidance, His presence. Because the goal, like I said, the goal of spiritual growth, the goal of spiritual growth is not make a name for this church, it's not to build one up with pride, it's not. The goal is the reflection of God's glory. And in that, that pursuit of godliness, hopefully the growth leads us to being more committed to Him, to, to loving Him more, to appreciating Him more, to leaning more fully upon Him every single day despite the circumstances. But He continues still, He says, to godliness add brotherly kindness. <clears throat> Brotherly kindness here is the, really the love we share with each other. And, it's, you know, we've talked about this before in Scripture. There's kind of different loves that were used in the original language here. And this is talking more about like the, kind of that, you know, warm family love. Just the, like the mutual support, encouragement, and compassion that we have for one another. When we just talked about godliness, godliness focuses on the vertical relationship we have with him and him alone. Like we have that one vertical relationship with a great and awesome God. But that vertical relationship we have with him, as that godliness grows in us, then that vertical relationship also expands horizontally <laughs> between us and the people around us. There's an outflow of the incredible vertical relationship we have with him that benefits the horizontal relationships around us. Brotherly kindness naturally flows out of godliness. When we love our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, when it is all about Him, then what He stands for and what He has done leads us to loving and caring for the people around us because that's what He does. That's what He calls us to. It's a natural outflow of the pursuit of godliness. But Peter still yet builds on this one last time. Because I said there's a couple different layers to love in the Greek language. He says to brotherly kindness add love, definitively. And there is still contrast and there is still growth happening in this step. And this might actually be the most significant step of them all here at the end. Because while brotherly kindness that we have between each other while brotherly kindness, you know, builds the kind of strong, affectionate bonds that we can have for each other amongst believers, this love, agape love, the love of God, extends further and deeper, and it's way more encompassing than just, you know, moral support and encouraging one another. This is a love that imitates Christ's sacrificial love for us. It's Him. He gave everything for us. Like this love transcends just like, oh, I feel like liking this person or I feel like doing this for this person or, you know, there's favorable circumstances right now. So, you know, I can act this way and do this and treat people this way just because the time is right right now. It's way beyond all of that. This is aiming for the highest good of others. It's demonstrating God's love through action and attitude. It's selfless. It's sacrificial. It seeks the best of others regardless of circumstances and regardless of personal cost. If there's opportunity, no matter what it costs me, if I can build this other person up in this way, if I can show them that love, I will. It's not to say we do that all the time, but that's the goal. The goal is to get to a place where I love my God so much and what he has done for me. I've begun to build out that, that care and compassion and for the people around me. But then I grow beyond that that says it's not even about me anymore. Like I've seen what he's done for me. It's not really about me anymore. I mean, it's great that he has promised me all of this stuff and I've got so much to look forward to. But what can I do to make things better for the people around me? But the great thing is when you're in a community of that, when we seek to put the highest, you know, care for the people around us, in a community that is everybody is doing that, then there's other people seeking to have your highest care in the forefront for them. 
And that growth happens in community as well. But we see all of these steps. We see all of these steps that Peter's been talking about this morning. And the question is really is, how are we doing on these things? Peter told us with all diligence, with all diligence, willing to put the work in, with all the diligence necessary, he said to pursue faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. Like as we sit here today, we see this track of spiritual growth. Starting with a real tr like a trust in God, having that faith, seeking to do good and wanting to do the right thing, to then be informed and to understand of what it means to do the right thing, to then have the self-control to be disciplined and to, to control myself, to act in the way that he has called me to do, to have the perseverance and the steadfastness to, to stay the course regardless of circumstances, to have that devotion and that godliness of saying it's all about him to have that extend to the people around me to actually love like I'm supposed to love. Like, how are we doing in these things? I know none of us can sit here and say we're perfect. This is what I always used to do with our college group back in the day. I was always like, how are you doing in these things? And if you can see a deficiency, if you can see a weakness in it, then the automatic follow-up question is, now what are you going to do about it? Because we should never be satisfied not being the furthest down the road that we can be, not being in the best place possible. We should never be satisfied with God getting less than he could get from our lives. If his glory is our greatest purpose, then we should not be satisfied with living a life where he gets less of it than he could get. I think of some of these passages, and I'll just look at these briefly. Like 1 Timothy 4. Let's see 2 in 1 Timothy. This for bodily exercise profits little. It does profit. I need more of it. But godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. He's like, there's things that we can do here. We can work on ourselves physically. We can obviously have to work in the physical world. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. But he says, but the pursuit of these things, the pursuit of spiritual growth, the pursuit of godliness has so much in store for this life. And it also actually means something when this life is over too. None of the other stuff will, but this will. It actually means something. A few, a little bit later in that letter that Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy, when he was just encouraging him as an individual, he says, but you, you, O man of God, flee these things. He's talking about the things of the world. He, this is, comes right after the, the part where he's talking about the love of money He's talking about the dangers and temptations and lusts and all these things. He's talking about how getting caught up in these things destroys people. He says, but you, and it's kind of like, I think you young man, like Timothy is still pretty young at this point. He's like, you, oh man of God, flee all of this other junk. He says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He says, you, Timothy, run away from this other junk. That's what Peter talked about in the, chapter, the passage before. He's like, you've already been saved from the world's grasp. He's like, get away from this stuff and pursue this. Pursue him. Pursue growth. Pursue all of these things. But notice that even when Paul writes this, he says, fight the good fight. He calls it a fight. <laughs> there is no like ambiguity. There is no vagueness in that. Oh, this is going to be easy. But no, he says, this is a fight. But pursue these things. The big picture of our lives is so much bigger than what we just see in front of us on any given day. Like we can just get so caught up in this and that and the little things of life. And sometimes they seem like really big things, but eventually we're going to zoom out. We're going to see all of it and see like, it wasn't that big of a thing. We made it through. We got to this. We got to that. Like there's so many things that we can just get so caught up in that we fail to see the big picture and the necessity, like we're talking about this morning, of spiritual growth. We let so many things cloud our vision. Peter mentions this here in this, in this 
2 Peter 1, this is an interesting statement. In verse 9, when he talks about, he gave this whole list of growth. He talked about all of these characteristics. In verse 9, he says, For he who lacks these things, these characteristics of growth, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. What Peter's saying there is like, you're not seeing the big picture here. It's like, I think that's a lot of times how we get stuck living our lives. It's like, I can only see what's in front of me and what I'm dealing with right now. Peter says there's more if you just look past that. You just look past that and you see what's greater. You just look past that and you see what the bigger picture is. You just look past that and you see your God and his glory. You just look past that and you see that he did save you from your old sins. Have we forgotten that? Have we been short-sighted? Have we only been seeing the things in front of us and failing to see the big picture? The beautiful thing, though, as we close here, the beautiful thing is, he says, if we pursue these things, if we actually make ourselves about growth and godliness, if that's what we actually purpose ourselves for, then we see in verse 8 that he says that if these things are yours and abound, if these are the things in your life, if this is what you're pursuing, he says you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of your Lord Jesus Christ. Like, you're not going to be unfruitful. You're not going to be barren. You see in verse 10, Verse 10 talks about having the assurance in our salvation that we won't stumble. Verse 11 says we will be provided entrance into the very kingdom of God. Maybe we sit here today. Maybe we sit here today and like we talked about last week, we're not feeling especially peaceful and maybe not appreciating his grace. Last week he said, Man, maybe we still just need to get to know our God better. Get to know the God of provision. Get to know the God who cares. Get to know the God of power. All of these things. Maybe we get to know, get to know him better. Because last week it says, then grace and peace will be multiplied into our life as a result of doing so. Maybe it's like, well, I know him. Maybe you don't know him enough. <laughs> because who he is and how much he cares for is such an overriding factor to everything else that's going on. But maybe we sit here today, maybe we feel unfruitful, maybe barren, maybe we're stumbling, maybe we're struggling in our assurance of God and his promises. Then the question that stands before us today, as a whole point of all of this, is are we pursuing life and growth his way? Or maybe we've just been trying to do it on our own still. Maybe it's like we like him, and I like the things, and I believe these things, but are we pursuing life and growth his way? Because last week he said, I've given you everything that you need to do this. But this week he said, but you got to put all of the diligence in necessary to see it happen. At the end of the day, I guarantee you that his way is better than whatever mess that we make for ourselves. And this passage tells us that if we go about it for these things in his way, it tells us of the good that will come from it. We won't be barren. We won't be unfruitful. We won't stumble. And one day we step foot in the very kingdom of God at the end of this road. So I just encourage you guys, growth. Let's not just be satisfied with just the status quo. Let's not just be satisfied where we're at. Let's not just be satisfied with good enough because good enough is not good enough because he's great enough for us to do better. <laughs> That's where our mind should be at. That's how much we should love and appreciate him. And like I've always said, like we're here for it. If there is any way we can help facilitate growth, if you, anybody wants to sit down with us one-on-one -on -one or, or whatever else, like we're not all the way perfectly down the road yet. But man, we'll do everything that we can and back into his word with you to, to see growth happen because it's about him and what he deserves. It's not about the time that it takes to get there, the effort that we have to put into it. He just deserves it all. And from us, just know that we love you and we would 
invest every ounce of diligence and opportunity to see more of it happen. And again, as we just close, are we pursuing life and growth his way?